everyone. Could you hear my music? Let me turn it off. And can y'all hear me? Um, okay, hold on. Figured I'd come on camera for a little bit. I still haven't figured out my, um, camera situation. So, oh my gosh, I forgot my kid drew all over me. Y'all, wait till you see my leg. Hold on. Oh, you can't see it on here. There's like drawings all over my leg because my child gave me tattoos earlier. <laughs> And I totally forgot that um, I had that. Oh, my. All right. Um, so, if you, Dave is really loud for some reason. Um, if you guys haven't looked into this case I'm going to cover tonight, it is pretty crazy. Um, your local. Yeah, definitely something fishy. No, I didn't keep the baby turtle. I put him back, but I wanted to keep him because I'm like, oh my gosh, something's going to eat him. You know what I mean? Like, I hate this camera angle from the side. I can't stand it. That's why I like haven't gone on camera lately because it's just so annoying. Oh, yeah, slug stuck to it. Um. Uh, well, welcome, Angelic Darkness. And if you know anything, feel free to chime in as I talk about it. Um, but yeah, guys, I used to have, like, my camera right in front of me. And then I got a new, like, gaming setup. And I have two monitors. And I just, like, don't have a spot to put it right in front of me yet. I have to get, like, a little stand for it. So it's kind of off to the side. And it's kind of annoying. But... We'll just deal with it. Thank you for becoming a member, Angelic Darkness. I appreciate that. I spent two days digging in, and I still can't keep all the people straight. I know. Well, all right. So I will say I do like to stay when I look at evidence. I like to stay neutral and just follow the evidence. But... um. I will say Turtle Boy has just been doing such a good job on this, like his blogs and all that. Not, he, I will, he's biased. Like he, and, and I will admit that I am leaning towards the way that he's leaning. Um, but like showing the evidence wise, I like to, to say kind of like in the middle, but I'm going to show his stuff just because regardless of, him being biased yeah he's just like done such good coverage and dug up so much stuff that i just feel like that's the best what like best angle to show it's like showing his blog um so that's how i'm gonna do it yeah he can be controversial but he's uh deaf he's kind of, he's Right, he's like an, an in your face kind of dude, and he, like, for instance, he put up like the entire family, like Jennifer McCabe's entire family photo, and named like everybody, uh, things that I technically wouldn't do, but I do appreciate that he does it because I know all the key players and stuff like that, but um, uh, yeah. That's a good point, CW. I mean, biases and like he's already kind of chosen a side. You know what I mean? Uh, like he's already chosen a side in meaning like bias. Yeah, he has a channel called Turtle Boy. I'll share it right right now. Um, but he's just had like kick ass coverage of this case. He's kind of like he trolls a little bit, and it... <laughs> all right, he trolls a lot, but. Like, he follows people and writes about them. He makes shirts. You know, he, he does a lot of... Yeah. I just put his link. Uh, yeah, he's cocky. I did appreciate... So, he, he covered the Dominic Crankle case, which I felt totally bad for the kid. He, like, 
uh, was caught on fire and had all these burns all over his face. But um, his mom really made like a big stink out of everything and saying that these kids threw like a flaming tennis ball at this kid. And they were just like being made out to be the most terrible kids to the public. And um, really, if you look at the camera footage from the day where, you know, everything went down, there's really nothing to show that, um, like, they set this kid on fire on purpose. It was definitely not on purpose. Um, I don't even think they threw a tennis ball at him. I think the kid did it himself, if I remember correctly. And he did, like, he really, uh, this is when I started watching him. He really went hard for the kids who were getting accused of setting this other kid on fire. And... I appreciated him for going against the popular opinion and the great and like stick up for these kids. Uh, so even though he, he has like a troll like way of doing things, he does stand up for what he thinks is right. And he's passionate about it. So, it's, you know, he's got a Massachusetts mouth there. I said it and I can say it. I'm born and raised here myself. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> he definitely does have a Massachusetts mouth. <laughs> Um, all right. So yeah, I'm going to do that. K Braze. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to use his blog and his blog is just so well done. He has pictures of every, I mean, he like, he breaks it down like the absolute best way you can possibly break it down. So, uh, hold on. Let me switch screens here. He, he did it very well, I will say that, so. Okay. Actually, that probably works better this way, so you can see my face. All right, let me share my screen. I'm going to share my screen so you guys can see the pictures and stuff. Okay. So like I said, he's already kind of like chosen a side and normally I try to like say in between, but regardless of the side he's chosen, he's just really broke this down so well that, um, you know, and I'll try to like make sure I put, you know, like as I talk about it, go from every angle to. Okay. So it starts off on the morning of January, let me zoom in a little bit so you guys can see better. On the morning of January 29th, 2022, Boston police officer John O'Keefe, he was, I think he's actually a Canton police officer, which, Jen, how, how close is Canton to Boston? It's in the same county, right? Uh, so... Boston police officer Brian Al or John O'Keefe was found dead outside of the Canton home of Boston police officer Brian Albert. So, uh, Brian, it's Brian's house. He owns this house, and this man, who's also a pl police officer, John O'Keefe, he was Boston. Okay. It's about 30 minutes or less from Boston. Okay, so he was Boston then. So Brian was Boston too, I guess. Okay, so anyway, John and Brian are Boston police officers. Uh, Brian is the homeowner. And John is found outside of Brian's house on the front lawn in the snow. O'Keefe's girlfriend... Karen Reed was charged with manslaughter after reportedly backing over O'Keefe with her car after she got into a fight with him and dropped him off at Albert's house after a night of drinking. So, in a nutshell, they go to this bar, right? Um, all right, let me just finish this paragraph, then I'll break it down better. 
She was castigated widely as a cop-killing villain, set to face decades in prison. But as it would turn out, at least a dozen people could have witnessed John O'Keefe being allegedly beaten to death. And a... I don't want to read this because it's like, this is his opinion, but... And I agree with his opinion, though, but... um, So... The defense thinks that Keith was beaten in the house and then they put his body outside and then they hatched a plan to frame it on Karen. Uh, they believe the cover up was aided and embedded by members of the Mach- Massachusetts State Police, Camp Police Department, and Norfolk County DA's office. This is the story of one woman alone facing down some of the most powerful, well protected people in the state who sought to destroy your life and exonerate herself. And now, like I said, that is like is his opinion um, of how everything went down. Okay, so this on the left is Karen Reed, and this is her boyfriend John. They go to a bar to go, you know, just drink in, have a little fun night, or whatever. At the bar, uh, John sees a friend of his, Jennifer McCabe. They know each other because. Jennifer's daughter is friends with John's niece. Now, John adopted his both of his nieces, so they lived with them. He was basically like their father. Um, Jennifer, let me see if I can find a picture of Jennifer. That is Michael Proctor. All right, this is Jennifer. She was at the bar. Her niece is friends with John, okay? This is John, or John's niece. That's John. So... Not only was Jen at the bar, but Brian Albert was at the bar, the guy who owned the house. And um, I guess John saw Jen there, and Jen was like, hey, after the bar, we're going to Brian's house for Brian's son's birthday party. If you guys want to come, head over. So, um, why is my... Yeah, I think, yeah. Um, So, they leave, Jen and Brian and them. There's a couple other people there. Uh, They go to Brian's house. Then, shortly after, John and Karen leave the bar. Karen uh, doesn't feel good. She decides she wants to go home, but she's going to drop John off. On their way there, John texts uh, text Jen and said he's, says he's on his way. Uh, you know, like, meet me outside when I get there kind of thing. Because she was the only person, despite him and Brian both being Boston cops, they didn't know each other. So she was really the only one at the party that he knew. Uh, Karen was an a, was or still is, I guess, a, a successful accountant and college professor professor with not even a hint of a criminal record. She has been dating O'Keefe for several years. She loved his niece and nephew, who he adopted like family. She owned a house in Mansfield that she rented out, but she lived with O'Keefe and his niece and nephew at his home on One Meadows Avenue in Canton. O'Keefe was well-liked was a well-liked 16-year veteran of the BPD. So he was there for a while, which kind of shocks me that he didn't know Brian. But I guess, you know, you can work in the same area and not not know people or maybe on a different shift. I don't know. Uh, On February 2nd, she was charged with killing him. And she may actually believe that she did because... um, you know, I think she may have convinced herself that she could have hit him or something. You know, she didn't, I don't think she knew, in my opinion. So this is her getting arrested at court. Hey, daddy's baby girl. All right, so this next up is Michael Proctor. State trooper Michael Proctor wrote the criminal complaint for her arrest, noting 10 years of his experience on the MSP detective unit at Norfolk County DA's office. Now, let me just explain this to y'all. Michael Proctor is 
uh, the guy on the case of Anna Walsh. The Anna Walsh case where her husband killed her. He's the detective on that case. So uh, that's interesting, I thought. Let me take some of my water. I, Trooper Michael Proctor, am a Massachusetts State Police Officer and have been police officer since 2013. I am presently assigned to the State Police Detective Unit at the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office and have been so since September 2019. During that time, I have investigated and processed serious and violent crimes, including murder, suicide, sudden and suspicious and unattended deaths, along with drug investigations. Through these investigations, I have participated in an execute search warrant, Blah, he goes over all his stuff, crime scene processing, all his um, his resume, basically. Based on the information contained in the numbered paragraphs below, which are the product of my own investigation and my discussions with Massachusetts State Troopers and officers with the Canton Police Department involved in the investigation, I submit that I have probable cause for an arrest warrant to be issued for Karen Reed. I believe the evidence of the crime of manslaughter, a violation of of Massachusetts general laws, negligent motor vehicle homicide, um, leaving the scene of an accident resulting in death. So there are her charges. He was Epstein. Like, what do you mean? Now, all right, so in a nutshell, they left the bar. She goes to drop him off at this after party, right? He gets out of the car, and she says she went home. Uh, Jen, his friend, says he never texts her, and he never came in the house. So Jen, thought, Jen says she believes that he went home with Karen. She never. She says she didn't even know that he came. Um, so Karen thinks he went to the party and Jen thinks he went home with Karen. So it's like four o'clock in the morning, you know, hours have gone by. It's like four o'clock in the morning now. And, uh, Karen is like, uh, yeah, well, that's what we think. That's what people think risk it hasn't really like you'll see why um i don't i don't know i think john was pretty drunk but i don't know if they ever checked karen um karen wasn't feeling well so i don't even know if she was drunk i'm not sure but jen and brian said that karen walked into the bar carrying a vodka soda drink in like a can from outside but they could have said that, too, to make her look like she, to make it appear as though she was drunk. You know what I mean? So, I, they don't really have proof of proof of that. I haven't seen anything about um, a, a um, alcohol, like if they did an alcohol test on her or anything. But in a nutshell, at 4 a.m., she starts freaking out. He's not home, which is unlike him, and it's a snowstorm. So she calls this girl, Carrie, and she calls Jen, and she's like, hey, I can't find him. She's texting him, where the F are you, you know, freaking out, and they go looking for him. Jen claims that in the car, Karen mentions, do you think I hit him? And then at some point they go back to the house and then they find his body on the lawn. Um, they find his body on the lawn and um, she starts, you know, freaking out, giving him CPR. They call 911. You know, he's in the snow on the front lawn. So here's where things get a little strange. You know, all this stuff is coming out. It takes like a really long time for the evidence to be handed over to, yeah, yeah, what happened in the house. So it took a really long time for certain evidence to be handed over to the defense team. They subpoena certain things, stuff like that. Well, 
Here they found, okay, so they received a phone extraction of Jennifer McCabe's phone done by a state trooper. Um, the state trooper said they didn't find anything of significance in Jen's phone that would be exculpatory. But, yeah, I was thinking that too, CW. I was thinking uh, maybe they suggested, do you think you hit him? And then she was like, um, oh, my gosh, you know, maybe I did hit him. Like, maybe something like that. I think they may have suggested it to her. Um, but anyway, they do their own request into Jennifer's phone records. And at 2.27 in the morning... Jennifer Googled how long till you die in the cold or something like that. I'll, I'll find it in here. It'll say word for word. But she literally Googled at 2.27 in the morning, like, how long till you die in the cold? Her phone shows she was up walking around all night. So she never went to sleep. And conveniently, shortly after... um. John got dropped off. Everyone left the party. And when everyone left the party, nobody saw John laying in the front lawn. You know what I mean? Like nobody saw him. All these people left the party. There was 11 people there. Not one person saw this man laying on the lawn. Um, anyways, he had these like big gashes in his arms. Okay, so... The cops are saying that that she hit him doing a three point, like a five mile an hour three point turn. But when you see this guy's injuries, like there's no way, there's just no way. Like this guy's got like cuts all down his arms. He's got a huge slash in the back of his head. He's got uh, two black eyes, um, possibly a broken nose. I mean, he was a mess. His brother said, John's brother said he looked like he went five rounds with Mike Tyson. Um, also Brian Albert, the homeowner, his nephew, I believe it is, um, Colin apparently didn't like John. I think they lived nearby each other and they were kind of like dueling neighbors or something or other. Uh, they didn't like each other. So the defense believes that John went into the house. Collins, Colin was there. And I believe we know Colin was there because he had called somebody for a ride home that night, right around, right after John showed up, not long after John showed up to his house. And, um, and, uh, Reed's blood is drawn a good smell. Forensic detective revealed her blood alcohol content was 0.07.08. At 1240, 1245 a.m. Oh, that's what it would have been at 12 a.m. So she was. Oh, so she would have been pretty drunk then. Okay. I mean. Um. I know his family believed that she hit him, um, but this was all before these texts came out. So I'm not sure what they believe now, but um, so the prosecution thinks he went in the house. Colin was there. Colin saw him. Colin hit him. And if there's several videos of Colin kind of like threatening people, calling them pussies, you know, giving the middle finger, whatever. Um, they think maybe he started a fight with John and um, that, I mean, they think maybe, he, yeah, maybe Colin started a fight with John and possibly Brian jumped in to help his nephew and Brian's dog, Chloe, which was a German, a, a very large German shepherd, could have possibly jumped in and started attacking him, leaving him, all these wounds on his arm. What makes it more interesting is after this stuff 
started, this theory came about. Brian Albert replaces his basement floor, sells his house, and gets rid of his dog. And mind you, this only happened last year. And he's done all that since then. Um, also, after... All right, so if Karen hit John, which it would have been around 12, 20 something, um, his phone would have been outside, just not moving. But his phone recorded him walking up and down flights of stairs after, like, at, like around the time he got there. And then after, after it, it goes like, calm for a while and then steps happen again after he was already dead so that's interesting um there's a lot of stuff which you'll see when i go through this and i'm it might this i might end up repeating everything through reading this but i just kind of wanted to like give you um guys like a rundown before i start it because i know everyone's kind of his cause of uh I forget, like, what, I guess, from, I think it might have been hypothermia, to be honest. I think it, it, it may have been hypothermia. I'll, I'm sure it's in here, but he was out laying in the snow for a long period. Well, I guess hypothermia and, you know, his injuries. He had, like, really bad injuries. So this is Michael Proctor. He's the guy who was the investigator on the case. The charging documents say that Canton officers Sarah and Mullaney were dispatched at 6 of 4 a.m. on January 29th to 34 Fairview Road, where they found three females, Karen, Jennifer, and Carrie Roberts, next to the body of O'Keefe. Reed was performing CPR. Officer observed the victim to be cold to the touch, not breathing, and returned to his cruiser to retrieve his AED, of, AED device. At this time, Canton Fire and EMS arrived on the scene and took over first aid. Paramedics transported O'Keefe to Good Samaritan Hospital. Undetermined. Okay. So I guess they, for manner, um, they, they put as undetermined, but... He had blunt force trauma. I would think blunt force trauma and hypothermia, but uh, at this time, Canton Fire and EMS arrived on scene and took over first aid. Paramedics transferred him to Good Samaritan Hospital in Brockton. He was determined to be deceased several hours later by Dr. Justin Rice. So this is Jennifer McCabe right here. Her. She is the sister-in-law of Brian and the friend of John. So that's the connection there. That's how she, he, that's why he was going to the party because she invited him. On the left is her sister, Nicole. So this is Jen McCabe and this is Nicole Albert. Nicole Albert is Brian's wife, the guy, the homeowner. This is Brian. Brian Albert is on the fugitive apprehension team. He is a trained MMA fighter and was featured on the cop show Boston's Finest. That's him. Thank you, CW. That's him right there. At 11.30 a.m. on January 29th, Trooper Proctor interviewed Jennifer McCabe and her husband, Matthew McCabe. Now, mind you, this is hours later. They were never brought into the station. They weren't immediately interviewed. They were interviewed at Jen's home hours later. And they were all there and had plenty of time to talk about whatever they had to talk about before they were interviewed. They told him that they were out at the Waterfall Bar in Canton where Jennifer met up with her friend John O'Keefe and his girlfriend Karen Reed, whom she did not know well. Jennifer told Trooper Proctor that she saw Reed enter the bar. Keep this in mind. 
carrying a vodka soda drink in a glass, which most bars would not allow. Which sounds like, you know, I don't know if that was true or not, or if they were trying to, like, exaggerate that she was drunk. The three grown adults in their 40s left shortly after midnight to go to an after party at Brian Albert's house. This guy. Jen's brother-in-law. According to Jennifer, she got there first and at 1230 witnessed Karen Reed drive up in her black SUV. Since O'Keefe only knew McCabe at the house, he texted her to make sure she was there. Jennifer claimed that O'Keefe never entered the house, so she texted him hello at 12.45 a.m. before witnessing Karen drive away in her black SUV. On January 29th, 2022, at approximately 11.30 a.m., I requested to speak with Jennifer. So this is his report. Um, we spoke with Jennifer, who stayed at her and some friends were at the Waterfront Bar. Jennifer stayed at her and Matthew arrived at the bar at approximately 9 p.m. At approximately 11 p.m., John and Karen arrived together. John and Karen have been in a relationship for two years, and Karen stays at John's house most nights. Jennifer observed Karen walk into the bar holding a glass cup from C.F. McCarthy's with a clear liquid inside, which she believed to be a vodka soda drink. Jennifer observed John wearing a baseball hat, jeans, and sneakers. John and Karen were at C.F. McCarthy's bar across the street before going to the Waterfall Bar. Jennifer stated that John and Karen to be in a good mood and did not observe any arguing amongst the two. She described the atmosphere inside the bar as friendly. There were no arguments amongst patrons. As the bar began to close down, everyone was invited back to 34 Fair Fairview Road. Oh, yeah. McCabe also... I forgot to add this earlier. McCabe also Googled besides, hey, butterfly kisses, besides the how long does it take for a body to die in a cold? She Googled how long does it take to digest food, which would be something a pathologist would use to determine time of death. So why would you Google how long does it take to digest food? Her Google searches were very shady to me. Uh, so, all right, so everyone was invited back to the after party at Fairview Road. There's a lot of people there. There was a couple other cops, people like that. At 12.18, or wait, sorry, as the group was exiting the bar, John texted Jennifer, where to, at 12.14. Jennifer replied with the address. At 12.18, John called Jennifer to ask where the house was located on Fairview Road, while inside the residence, Jennifer observed a black SUV arrive in front of 34 Fairview Road from the front door. She texted John at 12.31, hello, and 1240 a.m. texted, pull up behind me. Jennifer observed the black SUV move from the initial place. The vehicle stopped on the street near the driveway, then proceeded to the left side of the property. At 12.45 a.m., Jennifer texted John hello and then observed the black SUV drive away. Jennifer stated they discovered John in the area where she last observed the SUV, the left side of the property, at approximately 4.53 a.m. Jennifer received a phone call from Karen. That was when, you know, Karen called her freaking out saying that, you know, she couldn't find her. Hey, Alexander. Okay. Sounds good. Listen on two times so you can catch up. <laughs> she told Proctor. All right. So to continue on, she told Proctor she assumed he and Reed had went home. Jennifer received a call from distraught Karen at 4.53 a.m. looking for O'Keefe. Jennifer, who for some reason was still awake at 4.53 a.m., even though she left Fairview Road at like 12, like, like 12.50 maybe. Like they left. Right after John got there, they left. Like, everyone left the party. Like, why have an after party if you're going to make everyone immediately leave? And why would everyone just immediately leave? Which I thought was strange. Yes, cave rays. Uh, so, why was Jen still up at 4.53 in the morning? Uh, I don't know. You would think after a night of drinking, she would have went home and went to bed. But for some reason, she was still up. 
she told Trooper Proctor she offered to help Karen look for O'Keefe, along with O'Keefe's friend, Carrie Roberts, who was not at the house that night. Okay, so Carrie Roberts was a good friend of uh, O'Keefe. That's Carrie. That's John. She was hysterical and could not drive in her condition, so Carrie drove both of them. Jennifer claims that during the ride, Karen said, could I have hit him? Did I hit him? But we also don't know if they asked her, do you think you could have hit him? You know what I mean? We don't know what they said to her. That's what she says. She just said that. She also told MSP that Karen's SUV had a cracked taillight. And this is another thing. It is true that she had a cracked taillight. But when Karen was in a panic, leaving her house, leaving to look for John... She hit John's car with her car, and they have it on video. So she could have most definitely cracked the taillight at that point. The two of them jumped in Carrie Roberts' car, and they drove back to 34 Fairview Road. When they got there, they immediately noticed O'Keefe's body outside, but or Karen immediately noticed his body, but the other two did not, which I think is weird. How did they not see it, but whatever. This was part of the reason she was changed. She was charged. Tro- Trooper Proctor believed that Karen knew exactly where his body would be because she knew that she had ran him over and left him to die during the middle of a snowstorm. So because she got out of the car and just happened to knew where he was, that's why they think she had done it and, and left the scene. Hey, Lex. Hey, man, Miss Hatter. Hey, crazy mama. Um, O'Keefe's arm had six bloodied lacerations. His eyes were swollen shut and black and blue. His eyelid had a cut on it. His clothes were covered in blood and in vomit. A medical examiner said that the two swollen black eyes and a cut on the left side of his nose and a two inch laceration on the back of his head. And he had multiple skull fractures, which I just find a little like crazy that doing a a three point turn going five miles per hour would have done all that. But um, there is no possible. uh, I'm not I'm not going to read that part. Carrie Roberts told Trooper Proctor that Karen was drunk and hysterical when she saw her at 5 a.m. and stated that she was so drunk she didn't even remember going there. Carrie repeated the same story as Jennifer that Karen made statements suggesting that she may have accidentally hit him or had gotten hit by a plow or that he had gotten hit by a plow. Uh, That's just Carrie Roberts statement. At 4.30 p.m., Trooper Proctor claimed that he went to the home of Karen Reed's parents in Dayton and claimed to have observed Karen's SUV parked in the driveway with a shattered taillight. All right, so Trooper Proctor is the lead investigator. But let me just let you guys understand this. Trooper Proctor is friends with the Alberts and the McCabes and is seen in set... And, well, he denies it, but there's several pictures of him on Facebook at their birthday parties and stuff. So he's like, I don't even know them. Like he, sh- he should have one. He should have never been the investigator because it's a conflict of interest because he's friends with them. But two, um, he, when he, he tried to say that he didn't know them like that and he did. So he claimed that he went to the home of Karen Reed's parents at 4 30 PM in Dighton and claimed to have observed Karen's SUV parked in the driveway with a shattered taillight. So this is the next day at 4.30 p.m. You know, after his body's found in the snow, hours later, this is the next day at 4.30 p.m. He says he went to Karen's parents' house and he saw Karen's SUV in the driveway with a shattered taillight. He interviewed her and Karen denied bringing in a drink into the bar. She said she dropped O'Keefe off at the after party at 1215, but since she didn't know anyone there well and she was feeling sick and 
you know, she's, she's like a, she's a woman in her forties and that she doesn't go to after parties. She elected not to stay. She lived with O'Keefe less than three miles away. So getting home wouldn't be a problem. Proctor claims Karen told him that she never saw O'Keefe go inside the house and had no idea how she had a broken taillight. Both of these statements made her look guilty when she found O'Keefe's body. Later, his eyes were swollen and he was still bleeding from the nose and mouth. He says he observed the passenger side taillight to be shattered. Now, mind you, the first uh, look around at the uh, at this crime scene, they never found any tail light shards. But they went back a week later when like a foot of snow fell and found some on top magically. She stayed it as she dropped him off. She made a three-point turn in the street and left. She didn't see the victim enter the house. She told investigators she first observed the broken tallit in the morning and did not know how she broke it last night. But she did, remember, she did hit John's car when she left early in the morning in a panic to go find him. So it could have been broken then. Uh, she attempted to call and text O'Keefe multiple times after dropping him off. He would never not come home, knowing his niece and nephew needed him in the morning. Trooper Pro Proctor asked her leading question, design... Well, in... That's Turtle Boy's um, opinion. Hold on. He asked her if she had been in an argument with O'Keefe. Um... She obviously felt it was a normal response to tell Proctor they had an argument over breakfast... A Canton firefighter who responded to the scene of the crime told Proctor that Karen said to her friend, I hit him several times further incriminating herself. So firefighter Katie McLaughlin. Now, let me just add this. Katie McLaughlin is also a friend of the family. <laughs> She's best friends with Brian Albert's daughter or very good friends with Brian Albert's daughter. Karen Reed is John's girlfriend. Um, they believe that that she accidentally hit him while she was drunk with her car and killed him. But her lawyers are saying that that didn't happen and that he went into the party and that he got viciously beat and died and, and laid out in the snow and died and they covered it up to cover for the nephew and because there are several members of the police department, firefighters, etc., they all in conjunction with each other covered it up. But yeah, Katie McLaughlin is a good friend of, um, Caitlin Albert, which is Brian Albert's daughter. Uh, but I, she may have said, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him, because uh, I think she may have convinced herself that's what happened at that point. You know, she may have honestly thought that she did because she really couldn't figure out what happened to him. She may have been like, oh, my God, maybe I hit him. You know what I mean? Like, and if anyone asked a question, if they may have hit him, you probably didn't hit someone because you're going to know, like, you know, if you hit someone, you know what I mean? Now, this is from Massachusetts. Proctor's report also states that two red pieces of tail light were next to O'Keefe's body, which was the final piece of evidence needed to charge her with manslaughter. On January 29th, the Massachusetts Special Emergency Response Team was activated to assist the search for potential evidence outside of 34 Fairview Road. When looking at 34 Fairview Road from the street, there was a fire hydrant, blah, blah, blah. In the same area, two red plastic pieces of tail light were discovered consistent to missing pieces on Karen Reed's black Lexus SUV. One piece of clear plastic in the tail light was located in the same area. This wasn't... They didn't find that... They 
This was like later though. This wasn't like the initial search when they found that. Like with the initial search of the area, they didn't find that. Yeah, except in the original report, it was never stated what time the glass was found. This document above is slightly altered second version of the report. In the original, a picture from the crime scene does not show any fragments from the taillight. So keep in mind, hey Lynn, keep in mind the original report says nothing about the taillights. And the picture shows no tail lights, and this is a altered report later saying that they had found tail lights. But this was like typed up several days later by someone, which was an edit to the original one, saying they found it on that day. But the report initially didn't say that. Oh, that's so sad, Kayla. Oh, no. <gasps> that's terrible. Here we go. This is where it gets interesting. Trooper Proctor never once mentioned that he was close personal friends with the McCabe and Albert family, which was a very prominent name in Canton. Here is a picture from Proctor's sister's Facebook page showing Trooper Proctor with Jennifer McCabe's children. So there he is, Trooper Proctor, with Jen's children. So why is this guy investigating this crime? This is a com like a clear conflict of interest. Um, here's a picture from Proctor's sister's Facebook page showing her at a family party with Chris Albert the brother of Brian Albert directly behind her. So clearly the family. Oh, thanks Madhouse with Gertie. I appreciate it. I love you too. <laughs> I'm glad you're chatting. <laughs> oh, that is sad. That's really sad. It's a sin. So, obviously, he has ties to this family, the lead investigator. And it gets even better. Chris Albert was at the bar with O'Keefe that night. He was killed. But it's unknown if he was inside his brother's house that night because Proctor has been deliberately preventing Google from sharing that information. Chris Albert lives at 7 Meadows Avenue in Canton, two doors down from where O'Keefe lives at 1 Meadows Ave. His son, Colin, who was an 18-year-old senior at Canton High School at the time of the incident, is confirmed to have been in the house at 34 Fairview Avenue that night. So keep in mind, they're neighbors of John. So this is Brian's brother, Chris, and his nephew, Colin. And they're neighbors of John. Or, yeah, of John. And Colin was at the house that night. This one. Him. He was at the house. We don't know if Chris was there, but Colin was there because he had asked someone for a ride home. There they are again. Colin was a star football player at CHS and a notorious hothead. Two days after O'Keefe died, the Canton High School Twitter announced he'd be playing football at BSU. Colin, <laughs> according to Turtle Boy, um, he thinks Colin is an out-of-control meathead. Um, I did see some videos, so I'll agree that he was frequently confrontational. Um, he says towards his much older adult neighbor, John O'Keefe. I I guess that came out in court. I haven't seen, like, I, I need to, like, I want to see the actual report where it says that, but they're saying that he had confrontation with John. They were like dueling neighbors. No, 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 no. All right. They were neighbors of John O'Keefe where John O'Keefe lived. Okay. So John was killed at 34 Fairview where Brian lived, right? Brian's brother, Chris lived like, three houses away from John O'Keefe, according to their addresses. So Chris Albert was John 
John's neighbor. And Chris's son, Colin, was also John's neighbor, where John lived. And they're saying that Colin had, uh, yeah, they show, yeah, they show his knuckles. They're saying that Colin had, like, beef with John. He only lived a few houses away, but he had beef with John. Can you guys hear that? All right, ready? So these are all my friends. And, um, yeah, we're just having a fun time at Senior Prom. Go dogs! That's Colin. I think that's Chris's dad. That's Colin. I think his brother. Oh, no. Uncle. All right, so Uncle... His uncle Kevin Albert is a Canton police officer. So that's so Brian is a Boston PD. Kevin Albert. So these are all brothers. Brian, Chris, Kevin. Brian is Boston PD. John was Boston PD. Kevin is Canton PD. His father, Chris, was recently elected to the Board of Selectmen. Here he is on the left, pictured with his father and his uncle Brian on the far right. The man in the middle is the other uncle, Tim. Him. He's Tim. The family. <laughs> um... I'm going to skip that because I don't know anything about it, But Trooper Proctor's family knew Colin Albert since he was a little boy. So this is Trooper Proctor's sister. And she's tagging Colin Albert. What, like in a picture when he was a kid. Here's a picture of Proctor's sister posted on Facebook from her wedding in 2012 showing Trooper Proctor on the far left. Okay, here we go. All right, look at this. So Trooper Proctor, the guy who investigated, the lead investigator, that's him. And that's Colin Albert in a wedding photo. Not once did it ever occur to Proctor to mention that he was a close friend to a well-connected Canton family of cops and politicians and was investigating the death of a Boston police officer at one of their homes. He was in possession of all evidence related to this crime and decided who would and wouldn't be investigated. Colin Albert likes... Mm. Here is his... Here is a picture of Colin four weeks after this. After this all happened. And these are what his knuckles look like. Uh, all right. Well, I don't know if it's four weeks. It says, here is a picture. Somewhere I saw four weeks, but maybe it's sooner than that. Because it says, here's a picture he posted on Visco shortly after the death of John O'Keefe. Shows his right knuckles covered in abrasions. Indicating he had punched someone or something recently. None of this has been made public and the Norfolk County DA's office hasn't set a ma hasn't set a mountain of exculpatory hasn't sent a mountain of exculpatory evidence to Karen Reed's defense attorney until recently. So they were just Holding on, holding on to this evidence that they had that could exonerate her for a long time. Um, this evidence proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that, in, in Turtle's opinion, she that she proves beyond a shadow of doubt that she had nothing to do with the Keith's death, but suggests that Colin, Brian, Brian Albert's German Shepherd, Jennifer McCabe, and other people in that house that night witnessed the murder of John O'Keefe and conspired to frame Reed for it after the fact. 
Her attorneys filed a motion demanding a forensic audit of Jennifer McCabe and Brian Albert's cell phones for all communications before and after O'Keefe's death. Wait till you see this, y'all. Information to be produced. The production of all cell phones in the possession of and are used by Brian Albert between January 28th and present so that the defense expert Richard Green may conduct a forensic examination of the respected cell phones for the purpose of recovering incoming outgoing text messages, voice calls, voicemails, emails, location data, web searches, photographs, and other communications sent or received by Brian Albert. Same thing with Jennifer McCabe. Okay. Here we go. So when they received the information last week, they were shocked to discover that Norfolk County DA's office intentionally hid evidence showing that McCabe had searched how long to die in the cold at 2.27 a.m. on the night O'Keefe died. So mind you, they left the party at like 1 o'clock. She's home at this point. They didn't even find his, find his body yet. And she's Googling how long to die in the cold. Why? New revelations from Jennifer McCabe's cell phone must reverse the trajectory of this case, case. Evidence obtained from an analysis of the complete forensic image of Jennifer McCabe's cell phone with the Massachusetts State Police and Norfolk County District Attorney's Office withheld from the defense for more than a year actually the office sent them their their version of things and it said that they didn't find anything exculpatory in the phones they literally wrote they found nothing exculpatory in the phones how is that not exculpatory like exculpates misread and divisively incom implicates Jennifer McCabe and Brian Albert in the murder of John O'Keefe, in spite of the fact that John O'Keefe was found dead on the front lawn of Boston police officer Brian Albert, a highly trained boxer and fighter with deep familial and personal ties to the Canton Police Department and the Massachusetts State Police. Massachusetts State Police. Law enforcement has utterly failed to treat Mr. Albert and his family members who were present in the night in question as suspects. Instead, Law enforcement immediately arrested Miss Reed based in no small part on incriminating statements attributed to her by one of the actual conspirators in O'Keefe's murder, Brian Albert's sister-in-law, Jennifer McCabe. So that's what, this is the lawyers. Um, hey, Anne. So this is the lawyers. Um, the lawyers uh, motion that they filed. Brian Albert was never questioned at his house, only McCabe's house. Kenton Deputy Police Chief Tom Kelleher lives across the street from Brian Albert on Fairview Road. So the police chief of Canton Police Department lives across the street from Brian Albert. That's his house, and that's Brian Albert's house. However, he told police that conveniently he had cameras. Oh, here we go. Kelleher's ring camera would have picked up video of O'Keefe's body that night. However, he told police that conveniently did not capture anything of value, and it was not subpoenaed. Jennifer McCabe not only searched how long to die in the cold, she also deleted it. All communications from her phone between herself and Brian Albert. She deleted it all. <laughs> all texts and everything with Brian Albert. Why would you delete it all? An analysis of the complete forensic image of Jennifer McCabe's cell phone by computer forensic expert Richard Green establishes that Miss McCabe, the government's seminal witness, Googled how long to die in the cold at 2.27 a.m. on January 29th, exactly two hours after O'Keefe was last seen walking towards the Albert residence by Miss Reed. How long to die in the cold, Jennifer McCabe explicitly told law enforcement that she did not think much of O'Keefe's failure to enter the residence that night and assumed that O'Keefe and Miss Reed simply decided to go home. 
2122 interview of Miss McCabe, yet three hours before Jennifer McCabe had any reason to suspect O'Keefe hadn't gone home with Miss Reed, three hours before she inserted herself into Miss Miss Reed's search for O'Keefe and delayed her return to the Albert residence, and three hours before her discovery of his life hour, lifeless body in the cold snow of her brother-in-law's front lawn, Miss McCabe had only one thing on her mind. How long does it take to die in the cold? What's even more shocking is the very next day before turning her phone over to law enforcement, Miss McCabe took calculated steps to purge her phone of this inculpatory search and at the same time attempted to delete her communications with Brian Albert and remove a screenshot of his contact information from her phone, which she obviously shared with someone that morning. So, you know how you can share a contact? She shared Brian's contact with somebody. She deleted all messages with him, and she went back and deleted that search on Google. Why? Uh... Not only the defense asked for everyone at the party's phone. Yeah, the judge. Yeah, the judge is a total, uh, (laughs) I don't know. She pisses me off. Isn't the owner of the house daughter the investigator for the DA? Yes. Caitlin Albert works for the um, attorney general's office. She's an investigator for the attorney general's office. So they got somebody in everything. All right, where was I? In light of this new information, the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office should immediately do what's right and file a Noel Prosecki, I think that's how you say it. Short of that just result, Miss Reed's constitutional right to defend herself against these false allegations demand that she per- be permitted to obtain the critical information that law enforcement failed to obtain and preserve from the outset, namely communications and location information associated with the actual perps of this crime, Jennifer McCabe and Albert. The requested information will undoubtedly further implicate Jennifer McCabe, Brian Albert, and others in the murder of John O'Keefe. I think they need to subpoena everybody's phones, but the judge denied it because if they they were probably all messaging each other what to say and what to do. If Jennifer McCabe didn't think it was unusual for John O'Keefe to leave like that, then why did she stay up till 5 a.m. waiting Karen Reed's phone call about O'Keefe being missing? Jennifer McCabe had nothing to hide, then why was she destroying critical evidence? Why was Jennifer McCabe more committed to protecting Brian Robert and her sister Nicole? I don't know. I think it was more so like protecting Colin. But after O'Keefe got to Albert's home, he began texting McCabe to make sure she was there. Since she was the only person there he knew well, he ended. When he entered, he was surprised to see 18-year-old Colin Albert was there who confronted him at some point and hit him. That's the theory. Our sources believe that Brian Albert joined in on the beating, alarming his loyal German shepherd, which immediately began to tear into O'Keefe's arm. Despite being their family dog, Brian got rid of her and never explained where the dog went. O'Keefe was found unresponsive in the early mornings the front yard of Brian Albert's home. Contrary to Commonwealth series, photographs of O'Keefe suggest he was beaten severely and left for dead, having sustained blunt force injuries to both sides of his face, as well as to the back of the head. In addition to suffering numerous defensive wounds on his hands, consistent with a brutal fight, O'Keefe suffered a cluster of deep scratches and puncture wounds to his right upper arm and forearm. These injuries to O'Keefe's right arm were consistent with bite marks or claw marks from an animal, more specifically a dog. Brian Albert's German Shepherd canine is responsible for the injuries to O'Keefe's arm. Four months after O'Keefe's death, Brian Albert went to great lengths to dispose of critical evidence by making sure Chloe, his family dog of seven years, simply disappeared. Yeah, they do look like bites. I think I have a picture of that. Hold on, I'll show you guys. All right, hold on, I'm going to share it with you real quick so you can see it. I 
as his arm. Yeah, but they're making it very difficult to get a hold of this dog. Like, they're making it very difficult to, like, they had, there, it's been approved that they can seek out this dog, but they have to do a whole nother motion for a whole nother hearing to, to get to the dog, pretty much. But isn't that crazy? Like, I don't know how that could have happened. All this stuff could have happened getting hit by a car unless she like completely ran him over. But I think they would be able to tell that. All right. Oh, so you Google dog bites and they look similar. All right. Definitely in the house that night were Brian Albert, Nicole Albert, Brian Albert Jr. All right, so these people were definitely in the house. We got Brian Albert, his wife Nicole, Brian Albert Jr., which is Brian's son, Caitlin Albert is Brian's daughter, Jennifer McCabe, his sister-in-law, and Matthew McCabe, his brother, or, yeah, his brother-in-law, because... Uh, Jennifer would be his wife's sister. Two friends of Albert Jr. named Julie Nagel and Sarah Levinson. An ATF agent, Brian Higgins. He was at the bar also. Who has an out? Who has an office inside the Canton Department? O'Keefe would make a twelfth a twelfth person at a minimum when he got there. All right. So these are all people. It was Brian Albert Jr.'s birthday. Although Keith and Miss Reed were not well acquainted with the Alberts, the invite was extended to them by O'Keefe's longtime friend, Jennifer McCabe. Shortly after midnight, the Alberts, Brian, Nicole, and Caitlin, and the McCabes, Jennifer and Matthew, and Brian Higgins, I guess they forgot Brian Albert Jr., but close friend of Brian Albert and federal agent with Massachusetts, all right, so Brian Higgins, he's a good friend of Brian Albert. He was there, and he is a federal agent with the Massachusetts Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives with an office inside Canton Police Department, left the bar in their respective vehicles, and drove to Albert residence after the party. This is Higgins. That's John O'Keefe. So John O'Keefe's on the right and Higgins is on the left. This means that all of them witnessed the murder or aware of it and had, some, had said nothing. Most of them were not questioned by Trooper Proctor. So most of them weren't even questioned, even though they were at the house. One witness named Ryan Nagel went to the home to pick up his sister, Julie, who ended up staying there. He was the only witness who had no familial ties to the Alberts and thus no reason to frame Karen Reed. He witnessed Reed drop O'Keefe off and told police that he did not see any damage to her vehicle, hear any screams, or witness her operating the vehicle erratically. Nagel witnessed Karen Reed alone in the SUV, which directly conflicts with Brian Albert and McCabe's story that O'Keefe never entered the house. Additionally, O'Keefe's phone tracked him walking up and down stairs inside Albert's house from 1220 to 1232 a.m. Obviously, it would not show this sort of up and down motion if he was inside Karen Reed's car or lying on the ground outside of the house. Thankfully, because the Commonwealth finally produced a forensic image of O'Keefe's phone to the defense, even though it was a full year later, this court does not have to rely on the statements of witnesses as set forth in the attached affidavit of Richard Green, an expert in computer forensics and electronic data analysis. Data stored on O'Keefe's cell phone established that O'Keefe did, in fact, get out of the car and walk somewhere in the early morning hours of January 29th, 2022, at some point in the time when his location was consistent with being in the vicinity of the Albert residence. 
As defense expert Richard Green sets forth in the affidavit, uh, O'Keefe's phone established that his phone pinged in the neighborhood near the Albert residence, and again at the location of the Albert residence at approximately 1224. Immediately following his arrival, the Albert residence between 1221 and 1224, Apple Health recorded O'Keefe taking 80 steps and climbing the equivalent of three floors with his location data pinging in close proximity of the Albert residence. The only reasonable interpretation of O'Keefe's Apple Health data is that he entered the Albert residence, which has three floors. Between 1231 and 1232 a.m., Apple Health again recorded O'Keefe taking 36 steps with no elevation gain, traveling approximately 25 meters. O'Keefe did not walk... Walk the length of three swimming pools and climb, climb the equivalent of three flights of stairs by circling and climbing on top of Karen Reed's vehicle. Uh, O'Keefe took his last steps at 12.31 a.m., And here's another thing, that guy, Brian Higgins, he just happened to go clock in, like, after the party, I guess, to give himself an alibi so that, you know, um, it looked like, I guess, he wasn't there when the stuff happened. I don't know. Yeah, right, Jen? Like, they were all able to hang out together for hours before being interviewed, not at a police station, but at Jennifer McCabe's home. It's insane. All right, so remember how, okay, on February 2nd, 2022, mere days after Keith's death, Massachusetts State Police Trooper Keefe forensically imaged Jennifer McCabe's iPhone 11. Rather than simply turning over a copy of the forensic image of the phone to the defense for analysis, on May 31st, 2022, Trooper Gorino conducted his own forensic analysis of the cell phone and prepared a Cellbrite extraction report, which purported to be a full file system extraction from Jennifer McCabe's iPhone between January 29th and January 30th. The Commonwealth withheld the forensic image of Jennifer McCabe's cell phone and instead produced Trooper Grani Grino's full file system extraction report to the defense on August 12th, 2022. Notably, Trooper Grino's full file system celebrate extraction report of Jennifer McCabe's iPhone failed to show any search history information entered by Ms. McCabe on January 29th, including her incriminating 2.27 a.m. How long to die in the cold? So they handed this report over, but... That that search just wasn't in the report. It was just not there. <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? Hey, Eddie. Hey, Summer. After numerous discovery requests and filing a motion to compel, Deputy District Attorney Adam Lally finally agreed to produce the full forensic image of Jennifer McCabe's phone. On February 8th, 2023, a full year after Keith's death, information obtained from the deleted cache of Jennifer McCabe's cell phone begins to unravel what occurred after Miss Reed left O'Keefe at the Albert residence on January 29th and the web of lies that resulted in the arrest and prosecution of Miss Reed. According to Miss McCabe's initial interview with Trooper Proctor on January 29th at 11.30 a.m. when the events were still fresh in her mind, Miss McCabe claimed she left the Albert residence with her husband at approximately 1.30 a.m. and went home. However, a forensic analysis of her cell phone shows that she actually left the Albert residence at 1.47. Moreover, she didn't drive directly home with her husband, she initially claimed. Instead, the McCabe's made an executive decision at 2 a.m., in a snowstorm to drop off two of Brian Albert Jr.'s friends who were in attendance at the party, Julie Nagel and Sarah Levinson, passing O'Keefe's residence at One Meadows on their way home. The McCabe's clearly wanted to know whether Miss Reed would be home to notice if and when O'Keefe failed to return home that morning or if that privilege would be left to his two adopted children. So 
they the, the lawyers think that she that she drove by on purpose to see if Karen was there or not, so she, they could plan accordingly. A relative of a branch. Former Rachel Rollins is forced to resign due to. Oh, really? When? I thought she was the one. Um, I thought she was still doing it. When was that? All right. Anyway. Uh, at 2.23 a.m., her Apple Watch recorded her going to her bedroom and immediately Googling how long to die in the cold, despite previously telling police that she assumed O'Keefe had gone home with Reed. After passing by the deceased home at One Meadows Ave, she arrives back at her home at 2.12 a.m. Approximately 10 minutes later at 2.23 a.m., she recorded Miss. McCabe climbs one flight of stairs, goes upstairs to her bedroom, presumably goes upstairs to her bedroom. When questioned by law enforcement as, as to why O'Keefe never made it to the party, Miss McCabe told law enforcement she did not think anything of it and thought that Miss Reed and O'Keefe just decided not to come in. However, at 2.27 a.m. that morning, after making it safely home and climbing the stairs to the privacy of bedroom, the first and only information Miss McCabe desperately needed to Google was how long to die in the cold. Why would she Google that if she thought he was home sleeping? A normal person would go to sleep at 2.30 in the morning after a night of partying, but she elected to pace around her house nervously, waiting for Karen Reed to contact her and ask where O'Keefe was. She was up much of the night pacing. At 2.32 a.m., she took 22 steps. At 3.50, she took 24 steps. At 3.51, she took 6 steps. 4.55, she took 24 steps. Indeed... Or at, wait, at, uh, I don't know. Oh, exhibit. Indeed, Apple Health data obtained from Jennifer McCabe shows that her heart rate reached an 11 hour low at 1249 and a high at 642 a.m. Somehow she anticipated this happening despite having no idea that O'Keefe was missing. McCabe waited up for Reed because she needed to be with her when Reed discovered the body so she could control the narrative with police. She needed to put the idea in Reed's head that she may have accidentally hit and killed O'Keefe while driving drunk and had no recollection of it. Reed truly believed she might have done this and was distraught. His body was staged at the exact place where she was doing a three-point turn on her way out in order to make her believe this. So that's what they think. Despite barely knowing Karen Reed, McCabe gleefully jumped in the car with her and Carrie Roberts. This intentional delay guaranteed that O'Keefe would be dead by the time anyone found him and he would be able, unable to tell the real story about what happened. Meanwhile, Miss Reed, the only person... Oh, here. Hold on. After a fitful night of sleep, Miss Reed began frantically calling O'Keefe's friend shortly after 5 a.m. in an effort to locate him. Jennifer McCabe, who stayed out drinking until 2.20 a.m., was conveniently awake to answer Miss Reed's early morning call. Um, but Jennifer McCabe couldn't leave it at that. After picking up at 4.53 a.m., phone call from Miss Reed, an acquaintance of Keith's daughter, Kaylee, the overly helpful Miss McCabe, jumped out of bed and inserted herself into the search for O'Keefe. They think, she, like I said, she did it to be in control of the narrative. Remember that Jennifer McCabe initially told investigators that Karen Reed brought in a drink from another bar to the waterfall bar, which as the woman pulled up to Brian Albert's house shortly after 6 a.m., an unconscious O'Keefe laying face up on his back in the front of the yard at Albert residence while Miss Reed and Miss Roberts raced to him and attempted to render aid, Miss McCabe curiously remained in the vehicle, dialed 911, and began controlling the nar narrative. In her initial statement to Trooper Michael Proctor, she attributes a number of statements to Miss Reed that quickly make her the prime suspect. She said she was holding a drinking glass. 
basically implying that she was drunk. She says Karen said she could have hit him. I did hit him. She called her sister, Nicole Albert, at 6 or 7 a.m. Then deleted those calls. Someone answered the phone. This proved that McCabe had made them aware that there was a dead body outside of their house. Yet, Brian, a veteran of the police, Boston police officer and trained first responder didn't even come outside despite the fact that a crime scene was unfolding on his property. So there's a crime scene outside of his property. He's a cop and he never leaves his house. What do you need help with, Eddie? It's the Karen Reed case. There, this woman, she dropped her, her boyfriend off at a party and went home. He never came home. And they found him laying on the front lawn in the snow many hours later, dead. Uh, they, The people at the party tried to make it like Karen hit him with, tried to make it like Karen was drunk and possibly hit him with her car and killed him while she dropped him off. And then he never came in the house. But based on evidence they have found, uh, it kind of contradicts the situation and makes it look like John was actually killed inside of the party after a fight or something and his body was dumped. I just can't believe he didn't even go out and try and do anything or help. If he knew a dead body was out there and he's a first responder, why not go outside and help? Or, you know, you're a cop. Wouldn't that be the first thing you do is like feeling like you had to go outside and do something? Like, I know if I were a cop, that would be like, oh, I got to go do something, you know? I got to go help. There's a dead man on my lawn. Or someone who's dying, you know? According to Nicole Albert's statement to Tro Trooper Proctor, their friend, and Sergeant Yuri Buchanick, she and her husband Brian were still in bed when her sister Jen came in the room and shared with her what had transpired outside. And that John was found deceased on the edge of the property by the street in the snow. Nicole reported to police that she never left her home to see what was going on outside. By the time she came downstairs, Karen... Canton Fire Department must have already transported both John and Karen from the scene. However, cell records establish that immediately after disconnecting with 911, Jennifer McCabe actually made two calls to her sister, Nicole Albert's cell phone, a.k.a. Coco, at 6.07 a.m. and 6.08 a.m., both of which were answered by someone and were subsequently deleted. Thus, Brian and Nicole were among the first individuals to be notified. All right. They were notified before 911 even came. You know what I mean? Like, they were literally, 911 probably didn't even get there yet, and they knew. So, like, why did you not come outside? Thus, Brian and Nicole were among the first individuals to be notified that O'Keefe was lying unresponsive, mere feet away on their front lawn, and in spite of being in such close proximity, made no effort to go outside and assist or otherwise investigate the emergency that was unfolding on their doorstep. Who doesn't go outside when something is going on? If you see stuff going on, you at least go outside to see what's going on. You know, like if you're aware of something, you at least get dressed and walk outside to peek at all the craziness going on. But not only that, but if you're a first responder, a police, whatever, police officer, your, like, your instinct should be to run out there and help. So that's just crazy to me. Rather than check on O'Keefe, assist in life-saving efforts, speak with responding officers, or otherwise investigate the circumstances surrounding the fact their family member had just discovered the body of a Boston police officer. Not only that, he was a police officer. If you know that another police officer is dead on your lawn, wouldn't you come outside to help? Yeah, January 29th, 2022. A broken cocktail glass was next to O'Keefe's body, which Canton Police initially said was the murder weapon. Significantly, a broken cocktail glass was the only evidence recovered at the scene. 
Well, law enforcement initially responded to the Albert residence around 7 a.m. on January 29, 2022, and Camp PD initially informed medical personnel at the Good Samaritan Hospital that the broken cocktail glass was the suspected murder weapon. Notably, when Ms. Reed first discovered O'Keefe's body at 6.04 a.m., participation was minimal and there was no s- significant accumulation. Indeed, photographs taken from the time in question established there was only about an inch or less of snow that had accumulated. O'Keefe's body was clearly visible and appeared noticeably out of place on Albert's flat and bare front lawn. After notifying Alberts about the dead Boston cop on their property, good old Jennifer McCabe googled, how long does it take to digest food? Now, thank you, Eddie. Thank you for becoming a member. I appreciate you. Um, so here's what I think is funny. You just called 911. You just told your brother-in-law and your sister that some guy's dead on your lawn and your next thing to think of is google how long does it take to digest food because that certainly would not be on my mind you know like why would you want to google that at that moment in time at 6 23 jen makes an outgoing call to her brother-in-law brian which he doesn't answer and then and then she subsequently deletes the record of that call Less than a minute after failing to reach Brian Albert at 6.23 a.m., Jennifer McKay begins panicking and opens an article in Safari application by Healthline entitled, How Long Does It Take to Digest Food? What an unbelievably odd and incriminating thing to search immediately upon finding a dead body. Significantly, the presence of food particles in the descendant's stomach and upper small intestine serve as a source of information for pathologists in calculating the time of death. Almost immediately thereafter, Jennifer McCabe tried to overwrite her incriminating search from earlier that morning regarding how long it takes to die in the cold by researching it at a more appropriate time after she supposedly found O'Keefe's body in the cold. So she searched it again. However, in all the commotion and her haste to cover up her incriminating 2.27 a.m. So while all this craziness is going on, while they were trying to revive this man, she decides to Google. She's in the car and decides to Google the same thing. And then she says that Karen told her to Google it. At this point, McCabe was panicking because she knew how suspicious the how long the die in the cold Google search would be. So she decided to search for the same thing again after discovering O'Keefe's body, hoping it would make it look less suspicious as... This is something a person might search after finding a body outside. In doing so, she hoped that it would make the first search disappear, and it might have. Unfortunately, she spelt the words wrong the second time she searched. So the second time she searched, she spelled it like this. How long tie die in the (laughs) C-I-K-D? So it proves... Her first search was HOS long to die in the cold. And this one was different. So it shows she literally Googled it two different times and two different ways. She later told law enforcement that it was Karen Reed who told her to Google that. Thus, an attempt to deflect suspicion and justify this incredibly incriminating Google search, she referred it to blaming everything on Miss Reed. Unfortunately, Miss McCabe and her decision to Google how long to die in the cold at 2.27 a.m., two hours after O'Keefe made his way to the Albert residence, was hers and hers alone. Shockingly, in what can only be described as a clear attempt by Miss McCabe to frame Miss Reed, Richard Green's forensic analysis of Jennifer McCabe's phone reveals that Miss McCabe took affirmative steps to delete the 2.27 a.m. search, how long to die in the cold, but did not attempt to remove the other two subsequent searches she attributed to Miss Reed. So the one that she said Miss Reed told her to Google, she didn't try and delete, but she did try and delete the 2.27 a.m. one. Like, she went back to clear that history. Luckily... For McKay, Brian Albert's brother is a Canton cop. His other brother is a selectman. His neighbor is the deputy chief. And the trooper in charge of the investigation was a close family friend 
who helped cover up the murder was going to be covered up regardless. When you thought that Jennifer McCabe couldn't get any lower, she has also been sharing fundraisers for O'Keefe despite helping cover up his murder. Here's all her thing. <laughs> The defense is not suggesting that Jennifer McCabe killed O'Keefe and covered up his murder alone. The communications and contacts that Jennifer McCabe intentionally deleted from her phone in four days between O'Keefe's death and her decision to turn her phone over to law enforcement for analysis on February 2nd, 2022, were key to uncovering what transpired on January 29th. SF Morth fully below, she intentionally sanitized her phone of her contacts with Brian and Nicole on January 29th, before turning her phone over to law enforcement. The only reasonable inference as to why Jennifer would intentionally tamper with evidence she knew she was providing law enforcement is because, like her 2.27 a.m. Google search, she and Brian have taken calculated steps to hide incriminating information. Uh, here we go. As explained in the attached affidavit of Richard Green, the Cellbrite analysis of Jennifer McCabe's cell phone recovered various contacts and communications which were deleted by Ms. McCabe on January 29th. For example, on January 29th at 12.53 p.m., just hours after O'Keefe was found dead in Brian Albert's front lawn, Jennifer deleted a screenshot of Brian Albert's contact information, which she shaved in her phone as Uncle Brian A., she also deleted the phone call she made to Brian at the same number on January 29, 2022 at 6.23 a.m. Uh, all right, so here's another one. <laughs> here's more. Jennifer McCabe would have never been able to cover up this murder without the assistance of law enforcement, despite the fact that it was one of their own who was killed. According to Reed's defense attorneys, the original... Canton Police Department report had been altered. In the altered report, it never stated that the CERT team found them at 6 p.m. after Tro Trooper Proctor had taken possession of Reed's vehicle. The altered report also had a different cell phone number that McCabe called after finding the body, indicating police were taking steps to make sure Brian Albert was not in any way a suspect. An alter report swaps. All right, listen to this. However, the report produced on October 25th, the alter report, is different from the report produced months earlier on February 2nd, the original report, in two very significant respects. One, the alter report swaps the single crime scene photograph included within the report from a photograph that was taken on the morning of January 29th by Canton PD where there were clearly no pieces of Miss Reed's tally at the crime scene to a crime. So they, they took out the picture where there was. Oh, thank you for gifting memberships, Eddie. I can't, I can't see it on my end. So thank you for saying that, Jen. Thank you, Eddie. I appreciate it. So basically they took the picture out of the crime scene where there was no tail light shards. And then they replaced it with a photo that had taillight shards. <laughs> and, the, and the second photo they replaced it with was actually taken on February 3rd by Massachusetts State Police when Trooper Proctor purportedly recovered pieces of her taillight at the scene days later after he had already taken possession of her vehicle. But in the report... They still say the date that they found the pieces was January 29th, even though they found the pieces on February 3rd. Are y'all still with me here? <laughs> I know it's really confusing, but in a nutshell, I'm losing my voice again. In a nutshell, they swapped the picture out for a new picture that was taken days later, but kept the date as January 29th to make it look like they found tail light pieces on January 29th, when really they were pieces that they supposedly found February 3rd. The alter report replaces Brian Albert's primary cell phone number, the very same number Jennifer deleted from her already taken possession or already, hold on. 
the very same number, Jennifer deleted from her phone. Belonging to Uncle Brian A. With a completely different number. So they took Brian Albert's phone number out of the report. That was actually Brian Albert's phone number. And they replaced it with some random number that wasn't his number. So like. They didn't even put. They, they literally altered the report to take his phone number out, even though his phone number was evidence. It's insane. Thus, the witnesses in this case have made repeated attempts to conceal, hide, and erase any reference to Brian Albert's cell phone number in connection with this case. New evidence has also shown that Albert rehomed the dog that they believe attack Keith at O'Keefe. It's not a coincidence that Brian Albert got rid of his family dog of seven years due to a reported violent skin piercing incident four months after O'Keefe's death. So he supposedly got rid of him because he was a, a violent dog. In September 2022, Reed's lawyers publicly accused the Albert family in open court of being implicated in O'Keefe's murder and ordered them to not delete anything from their phones. Two weeks later, Tim Albert posted this meme on his Facebook page stating that you don't F with my family and he won't hesitate to make you miserable if you do. After being accused in September by Reed's attorneys, Brian Albert immediately decided to sell his childhood home. So the lawyers were like, hey, we're on to you guys. We know you did something. And then he immediately went and sold his home. This is crazy. This is just crazy to me. Hold on, where was I? Brian Albert made the decision to list his childhood home and longtime residence for sale, which had been in the Albert family for multiple generations. According to public records, the Alberts accepted an offer on the house exactly three months after it was listed on February 17, 2023. That sale is currently pending. Albert's decision to transfer document ownership of his longtime family residence is yet additional evidence of consciousness of guilt, the lawyers are saying. The most, the person most responsible for the cover-up was Trooper Proctor, who failed to speak to key witnesses, protected his close friends, and never applied for geofence data that would show the identities of every single person at the house that night. He has consistently frustrated court orders regarding this matter. He is, in particular, among other things, failed to meaningfully obtain and preserve geofence data that is critical to the investigation in the case. As set forth herein, Ms. Reed respectfully but urgently requests that the court issue in order to ensure that critical geofence data, which will unquestionably provide necessary exculpatory details regarding the interested parties, movements in the early mornings of January 29th, is preserved and produced to defense counsel in the manner that I think that was what was denied. However, Brian Albert didn't mention until April in front of a grand jury that his dog was aggressive and not great with strangers that night. Notably, Brian Albert testified at the grand jury that sometime after arriving home, he retrieved and brought his large German Shepherd dog downstairs because it was barking. Mr. Albert testified that he kept the dog restrained because it was not great with strangers. And then let the dog outside unaccompanied so it could go to the bathroom in the fenced in yard in the house. Uh, to be clear, no witnesses suggest they observed Miss Reed strike O'Keefe with the vehicle, injure him in any way, make a three part tone or otherwise drive erratically on the night in question. Not one witness. They don't have one witness that has seen her do any of that. So, like, how are they charging her with this? 
The common law theory is predicated entirely on flimsy speculation and presumption underpinned by questionable and biased investigation and highly dubiously claimed physical evidence. Meanwhile, at least six individuals have claimed to have left the Albert residence in the early morning of January 29th after Miss Reed had left the Fairview residence and returned home. Jen and Matt reportedly drove Julie Nagel and an unnamed female home at 1.30. Brian Higgins supposedly went to complete administrative work at the Canton Police Department around 1.30 a.m. So he just left the party and went to, to work at 1.30 a.m. Colin returned home to his parents' residence at 12.30. Yet none of the individuals, not one, claims to have seen Mr. O'Keefe's body on the front yard. So all these people left the party and went home. And not one person saw this man laying on the front lawn. It's incredible. Like, how do you not see a big ass dude laying on the front lawn? Remember, they allegedly had no idea he was dead. So why would they all leave the scene of the crime around the same time? Can police use red solo cups to store blood evidence at the crime scene, but did not discover any pieces of broken taillight on their first search. No red or clear pieces of plastic consistent with taillight lens were observed or recovered by any of the officers inspecting the crime scene at the time. So when did she break her taillight? Surveillance video from Karen Reed's home show her backing into O'Keefe's car slightly on the way to search for him. How did they find pieces of taillight later after Canton police did not find any in their first report? Well, conveniently, they appeared hours after Proctor took Reed's vehicle and state police, perhaps on a hunch, decided to search it again. Luckily, they found it this time. Even more remarkably, Canton Chief Ken Berkowitz also decided to go to the scene of the crime on a hunch and noticed more pieces of the taillight. Uh... All right, significantly, Trooper Proctor's timeline of events as set forth in his sworn affidavit support the G-Offense warrant is probably false. Security footage taken from Miss Reed's parents' residence established that Miss Reed Black Lexus SUV was towed from the driveway by Diamond Towing in North Dighton at 4.12 p.m. Not 5.30 p.m. like Trooper Proctor says. So Trooper Proctor said her car was towed at 5.30. It wasn't towed at 5.30. It was it was towed at 4.12. He lied and said it was towed an hour later. That altered timeline means that both the Lexus SUV as well as Trooper Proctor would be unaccounted for during the entirety of that one hour and 18 minute gap where he would have an hour and 18 minutes to get some pieces of tail light and go plant them. Thus, Trooper Proctor and certain personnel from the Canton Police Department, where the vehicle was towed, had unfettered access not only to Miss Reed's vehicle and its taillight, but to the crime scene as well for more than an hour before the search team executed its search of that scene. How what? Thereafter, the search miraculously revealed, for the first time, red and white pieces of plastic found on the ground consistent with the taillight of Miss Reed's vehicle, thereby establishing the only physical evidence against Miss Reed in the entire case. So the only evidence that ties Karen Reed to the murder is these taillight pieces. That's it. There is no other evidence at all. And this evidence, <laughs> this guy literally had an hour and, and unaccounted for hour and 18 minutes with her car and the crime scene where he could have taken those tail light pieces and thrown them in the snow before the cert team got there to search it's crazy the investigation of the crime scene however did not stop there according to detective michael lang's testimony before grand jury on february 4th one full week after it keeps passing Ken Berkowitz, the chief of Canton Police Department, reportedly drove by the Fairview residence on a whim and saw from his moving vehicle an additional piece of red plastic that was consistent with the taillight of Miss Reed's vehicle. It is worth recalling that the scene, this was a scene that had been searched, researched, and searched again. That 
with no fewer than three sets of police officials. Yet Chief Berkowitz claims he glanced from his moving car while driving a tiny shard of lens material on the ground many yards away and at speed recognized the shard's evidentiary value evidentiary, evidentiary value and stopped his car to report the finding. Straining cred, credulity does not begin to describe this account. It is worth noting that one of the officers under Chief's command Kevin Albert is Brian Albert's brother. So Brian's brother is one of the cops under the chief's command. Oh, wow, Anne. Jeez, oh man. Good luck. <laughs> My voice is killing me right now, but we're almost done. Berkowitz had been called by ATF agent Brian Higgins, who was in the house when Akif was murdered immediately after the killing. Detective Lang testified that the chief of police then notified Massachusetts State Police to report what had been discovered before state troopers arrived. However, Canton police officers had already responded to the scene, taking photographs of what the chief of police claimed to have found on Fairview Road. When an incredulous grand juror specif specifically inquired as to why the chief had responded to the Fairview residence and how he discovered the evidence, Detective Lank explained, nobody called the chief. When pressed further by the juror as to why he wandered over there, Detective Lank recounted through hearsay, he was driving down Fairview Road and he saw it, the evidence. Equally suspicious is that Brian Higgins testified that his close personal friend, the chief of police, Ken Berkowitz, called Higgins for some unknown reason in the early morning of January 29th, just before Brian Albert notified Higgins that Mr. O'Keefe had been found dead in his front yard. Chief Berkowitz repeated in and convenient involvement in the investigation that is outside his jurisdiction should at least raise eyebrows, especially considering his close ties to the occupants of 34 Fairview Road. Mind you, it's outside his jurisdiction. He has no control over that case. But he just happens to drive over there and find some evidence. I can't. I can't with these people. Trooper Proctor also went out of his way to make sure Google didn't send him all the geofence data that the defense had requested. Uh, on January 28th through and including January 29th, the request specifies that it applies to any location data currently stored in relation to any devices identified within the set parameter account information to include all account owner user identification information to include all information listed in your personal info within the Google My Account screen. To include all apps downloaded from Google Play to any of the devices within the set perimeter. On May 16th, Google acknowledged receipt, so they put in they put in that they wanted the geofence data. Google acknowledged the receipt of the initial preservation request. On May 18th, 2022, after realizing that the preservation request, as worded, would exclude applications containing location data that had been downloaded from the App Store, undersigned counsel emailed District Attorney Adam Lally requesting modification of the preservation request to include all smartphones. A.D. Lally responded to this email the next day on May 19th, 2022, with a modified preservation request designed to include iPhones. So he only did to include Android phones, but left out iPhones. To date, however, defense counsel has received neither the automated acknowledgement from Google that it would indicate that this amended preservation request was ever received, nor a confirmation from Google noting its intent to comply with the amended request. 
Proctor further indicates that any records in response to the GF events warrant be provided directly to him via email or digital storage media. Put simply, Trooper Proctor will singularly make any and all determinations of relevancy regarding the data produced by Google. So he'll look at the data and he'll decide what's relevant and what's not. Given Trooper Proctor's close familial relationships with the prosecution witnesses and potential suspects, in this case, his insistence on being the sole gatekeeper of this information raises serious questions as to the objectivity of the instant investigation and unquestionably creates an appearance of impropriety. Karen Reed is... Hold on. Oh, it's not in here. All right, here's another thing that I found really interesting before I end this. Proctor, in his report, where he took all the witnesses' names down and everything, mind you, he knew a lot of these people personally. Like, he knew them well. He spelled almost all of the witnesses' names wrong who were at the party. Anybody who, anybody who was a witness that wasn't related to the family, he, he intentionally spelled all of their names wrong, making it more difficult for them to find the actual witnesses because their names were all spelled wrong. He literally spelled every name wrong. <laughs> like, it was, why did you not ask them? Your cops are supposed to ask how to spell each and every person's name. Like, how do you spell it? How do you spell your last name? Every single one of the names were spelled wrong. So, it's super shady. Um, there's, there's so much more. Like, this is just a very small bit of information. I mean, there's like so much. Um, I just, I'm, my voice is going again, so I can't keep going on tonight, but I promise we'll continue either tomorrow or Saturday because there's so much more. It's just, it's insane to me. And it's like, Yes, I agree. I love a good defense trial. I don't know why, but I love it because like, like I love the Morphew case for that reason too, because a good defense trial really shows how not put together some investigative departments are and how bad they do things. For instance, there was, thank you, so <laughs> um, there was this one case, right, where this, it was actually my friend's dad, and she told me about this, wow, I can't say names, but his name, this guy's name was like Carl, Carl, Carl something, I forget his last name, but there was this, there was these two girls that were outside doing their homework, or one girl, sorry, she was outside doing her homework and she was kidnapped and she was killed. And they, they blamed the neighbor. They arrested him because in his garage, he had a, like the same tarp as the tarp the girl was found in and the same rope. And then when they looked in his car, they found purple flakes of nail polish that were sim similar to the girl who was found dead. We'll get this. They sent the nail polish flakes to this DNA person to test the DNA. She didn't even test the DNA. She said it was a match. She didn't even test it because she was so sure that that guy was the killer. And her, she was had these blinders on because she wanted to know who the killer was so bad that she said she tested the DNA and she didn't. And that, and basically said it was a match and this guy went to jail and then the serial killer killed another child and that's how they found him. How messed up is that? That she sent this man to jail without even testing the DNA and said it was a match because she was so sure that that guy was the killer. She didn't even test it. It's crazy. You never know never know like 
what is going on. You know, with anyone, you know, like someone you would think is a total professional could be a total, you know. So I just love a good defense case because, man, good lawyers will, will really break down how things are done. And this is a good one. Like, this is a real good one. So I was like, man, I got <laughs> I got to share this because. But um, I got to go because it's 1130 and I'm starving right now and I need to get ready for bed. But um, I need to drink some water because my throat hurts. But I'll be back Saturday and we'll continue down this uh, <laughs> really deep rabbit hole. And, um, I know it was a lot of talking today, but next time I'll try and show a lot more pictures and things like that. Oh, thanks, Mad Miss Hatter. And welcome all the people who are gifted memberships. I'm so glad y'all are members now. <laughs> You can use my little lizard emojis. I know. I got you hooked, CW. I know I did. <laughs> I sent all this stuff to all my friends. Actually, my friend sent it to me, and she was like, Kate, I got the perfect case for you. She knows me. She knows, <laughs> like, the cases I'm into. And she was like, you got to check this case out. So I checked it out, and then I sent it to all my friends. So. Thank you all for coming, and oh, Lori, you, you, did you gift memberships? Thank you, Lori. Anyone who gifted memberships, thank you. Sorry, I was so into reading that I didn't even, like, damn two days. I can try and come back tomorrow. I, I might have time tomorrow. If I can come back, I usually go live, like, every other day, but I can try and come back. Oh, I hit it by accident. Sorry. I was just saying thank you, Lori, and that Lori's my new mom. <laughs> we were just talking about it in chat and that I made Lori my new mom. All right. Good night, guys. Uh, I'll try and do it tomorrow. If not, I promise Saturday, but I'm going to shoot for it. I'll, I'll try and shoot for tomorrow. It's a, it, it's a joke. <laughs> Lori's in, in my uh, mod chat, and I was telling her I need her to be my mom. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lori. <laughs> all right, good night, guys. Thank you all. I appreciate you.